Oh, hello and welcome to the first video of a series of videos regarding the subject cell biology. Before we start, I need to make something clear that these videos, more than anything else, are a list of suggestions. Uh, there are a list of suggestions of the material that I think is important, that I think will come up in the exams based on the things that based on the exams that I took myself and the things that I heard from last, from previous year's students and uh, from teachers that these parts may, that they are more probable to come or not. But it, this does not mean that the material that I do not cover will definitely not come in your exam. It, it does not mean that. And I always encourage you to go and read all the material if you have time but well these lectures are uh, these videos are here to provide you a uh, concept a basis of each lecture and there will be a special emphasis on the minimals and that is about it one more thing is that I I'll start the lectures from the second one I start the first video from the second lecture because the first lecture is mostly introduction but there's a uh, the, the material for the first lecture is uh, very little and it's mostly from high school it's in the symbiosis and I know I'm sure if you the you just uh, read it you're gonna remember everything so we're gonna start from the second lecture which is cell membrane and transport given by professor Gabor Saba so by all means let's get to it well this lecture is mostly about transport and the emphasis of the lecture is especially on this cell membrane transporters but at the very beginning of the lecture there is a, a very simple introduction to the cell membrane itself now the things you need to know about the cell membrane of eukaryotic cells is that it's a bilayer it's a phospholipid bilayer and within this phospholipid bilayer there are proteins there are carbohydrates there are other things so if it is a phospholipid bilayer most of it is formed by lipids about 40 to 60 percent and then proteins and then carbohydrates i wouldn't uh, recommend to memorize all the numbers in the lectures especially cell biology it's not about memorizing all the numbers it's more about uh, knowing the ratios like you should know that the lipids uh, form most of the bilayer and that is about the ratios of cell membrane there's here a slide uh, uh, showing a gram negative bacterium membrane uh, this slide I think is here to the uh, to show the difference between the differences that can be between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells as you can see a gram negative bacteria has got two sets of layers a bilayer which is the inner layer which is very like eukaryotic cells and uh, we're gonna uh, study we're gonna learn about how these uh, inner most membrane which is a uh, which resembles a, a bilayer is very alike the eukaryotic cells in uh, any aspect that it has got uh, transporters especially abc transporters on it and it, the gram negative bacteria also has got a outer membrane which is specific to it and well the membrane as we said is mostly formed by lipids but it is a bilayer so it has got an outer and inner layer a cytosolic portion and an extracellular portion as you can see in uh, this picture here so the thing about the bilayer is the total ratio of phospholipids in the outer and inner layers of the membrane are equal so as you can see here, the total phospholipid ratio in the cytosolic and extracellular 
uh, aspect of the bilayer is equal. But when we talk about a specific phospholipids like sphingomyelin, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylamine, which I think you studied in uh, MedChem, you can see the ratios differ in case of inner or outer uh, surface of the bilayer. By the way, I don't think you need to memorize these names, but what the name you need to memorize is phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine is a phospholipid that, as you can see, it, uh, its amount in the outer surface, in the extracellular portion, is approximately zero. So approximately all the uh, phosphatidylserine uh, are present in the inner portion, in the cytosolic portion of the bilayer. Now this uh, these phospholipids can be flip-flopped uh, in the membrane. They can move and they can uh, sometimes go in the, from the inner aspect to the outer aspect. And that can happen to phosphatidylserine too. But when does that occur? Is when the cell wants to send eat me signals to phagocytes. Especially, it, uh, this is a special event in case of programmed cell death or apoptosis, which we're going to talk about later in detail. But what you need to know for now is phosphatidylserine is usually always in the inner aspect, but when it's exposed to the outer aspect, when it's flip flop or scrambled and uh, goes to the outer aspect, to the extracellular portion, it will send eat me signal to phagocytes to actually, these phagocytes to come and degrade the cell. Now that we've talked about the membrane itself, let's talk about the transport along the membrane. Now, this membrane, this phospholipid, this uh, phospholipid bilayer, as you know, uh, uh, has got a uh, hydrophobic and a hydrophilic portion because of the uh, uh, phospholipids that themselves has got, have got a hydrophobic and hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic portion. But the hydrophobic tails of these phospholipids, which make the, the, the most of the membrane, make the membrane in total hydrophobic. So as you can see here, in case of diffusion of material through the membrane, small nonpolar molecules can diffuse better than anything else through the membrane. Well, the small molecules, it's understandable, it's common sense, the smaller it is, the better it can pass through. But why nonpolar? Because nonpolar molecules like lipidophilic molecules or uh, the other term for it, hydrophobic molecules, can interact better and easier with the hydrophobic membrane. So there's a phrase in chemistry which likes uh, like to interact with each other. So the nonpolar or hydrophobic molecules, they like to interact with the hydrophobic membrane. So as you can see here, when it's a small uh, yet uncharged molecules, the diffusion will decrease uh, the very much. And the polar. Uh, then the larger molecules, the more uh, polar, the less they can pass. But when it is charged molecules, when we're talking about, uh, uh, sorry, charged particles, when we're talking about ions, you can see there is no diffusion. So ions cannot diffuse through the membrane, but there are other alternative pathways for these ions to pass through the membrane, like transporters, like channels, which we're going to talk about just in a moment. Here. So, a lot of these material, these molecules, and these ions, in order to pass through the membrane, they need to uh, be helped with a channel or a transporter or, for example, an ionophore. But 
the the two main categories of transport membrane transport are passive and active transport as you can see here now passive transport as you can see we, we have channels we have transporters and we have simple diffusion so but in in total passive transport has got two categories simple diffusion and facilitated with channels and transporter mediators and ionophores which which are not shown here but you can see them here ionophores are types of passive but facilitated transport and then we've got active transport uh, so one thing to mention is you see here channel every time that you see a channel any time that you see a channel it means passive transport so what is the main difference between passive and active transport in case you forgot from biophysics active transport transports ions against their electrochemical gradient potential as you can see here this is an active transporter you can see this particle is getting transported against their electrochemical uh, potential uh, gradient and they also transport molecules against their concentration potential gradient so ions against their electrochemical uh, potential gradient molecules against their concentration potential gradient why because when we're talking about ions ions they don't just have a concentration they also have charge so when we're talking about the transport of ions we uh, we have to also mention their charge that's why we say electrochemical potential gradient and uh, so the active transporters transport against uh, uh, and they use uh, for this uh, transport they use energy either via direct hydrolysis of ATP or by using uh, the ion flow provided by another ion species which which these are called the primary and secondary type of active transport which we're going to talk about but first uh, let's focus on the passive transport here now the passive transport itself, as I said, uh, is uh, divided into a simple diffusion and facilitated passive transport. In facilitated passive transport, we've got channels and we've got a special type of transport mediators, which are called uniporters and ionophores. About uh, in case of ionophores, I don't think you need to know more than that. Uh, uh, valinomycin is a type of ionophore which is selective toward potassium and in case you don't know you don't have any idea about ionophores ionophores are simply like um, uh, they're like vessels which can uh, grab these uh, ions outside the cell and then transport these ions inside the cells these ionophores can go can pass through the cell membrane and they're somehow tricking the cell membrane because they come to, they have this uh, potassium with themselves but uh, potassium uh, whereas potassium itself alone couldn't pass the cell membrane that is about ionophores now let's talk about uniporters uniporters are as i said a type of passive facilitated transport so whenever we're talking about uniporters there is no energy use so there is no ATP hydrolysis and an example a very good example of a uniporter is GLUT1 now GLUT1 is expressed in the basal lateral domain of epithelial cells in case you don't know what basal lateral means or what the epithelial cell means wait a bit you're gonna uh, you're gonna learn it in details in histology but just uh, a basic uh, uh, information is that epithelial cells are uh, are the covering cells and we here we're uh, in a specific talking about epithelial cells of intestine so when uh, you can imagine the lumen of intestine the cells just adjacent to the lumen of intestine they're epithelial cells and these epithelial cells absorb the glucose which is digested and now is in the lumen of intestine 
and the, then glucose from these epithelial cells will go to the bloodstream. So here you, you can see a membrane. Let's assume above it is the epithelial cell itself and under it we've got the extracellular matrix and the blood uh, vessels are under it and so glucose is now in the cell. Now how glucose ended up from the lumen into the cell we're going to talk about it just in a moment but first we have to talk about how glucose goes from within the cell to the ECM to the bloodstream. Now the concentration of glucose in the cell in these epithelial cells is very high. It's higher both than the lumen and than uh, the uh, extracellular matrix. So the transport of glucose molecules from the cells, uh, from within the cells to outside, uh, to outside the cell is a type of passive movement because it is down its concentration gradient and for that we're gonna need some uniporters and what these uniporters do is that they uh, undergo transitional conformational changes in one state in one conformational state they face the cytosolic portion of the cell where they bind to the glucose molecules let's assume these blue ones are glucose molecules and gluco when glucose molecules are bound with uh, these uh, uniporters which in our case is GLUT1 then GLUT1 will undergo a conformational change and will expose to the extracellular portion and glucose will leave the uh, uniporter or GLUT1 another example of uniporter is GLUT4 now the difference between GLUT1 and GLUT4 is that GLUT4 is expressed on the surface of cells in response to the secretion of insulin. And that's what you need to know. Now we talk about active transport. Active transport is then itself divided to a primary or ATP driven transport and a secondary or coupled transport. First, let's talk, uh, and uh, by the way, you can ignore this uh, light driven pump. Uh, the, the two main types of transport are the ATP driven and coupled transport. And the ATP driven or primary itself is uh, subdivided to three types of uh, uh, transporters. Uh, P-type, V-type or F-type and ABC transporters. We're going to talk about ABC transporters and ABC proteins in a lecture just about ABC proteins. So first let's talk about P-type and V and F-type uh, primary transport. The main difference between P-type and V and, or F-type transporter is that P-type transporters they get transiently and covalently phosphorylated while performing their action while hydrolyzing ATP in order to transport material whereas V-type or F-type transporters they do not get uh, phosphorylated covalently although in both cases ATP hydrolyzes except in F-type in F-type, ATP doesn't hydrolyze. And an example of F-type uh, transporter is the uh, ATP synthase uh, complex in the inner membrane of, of mitochondria, which we're going to talk about in the lecture about mitochondria. So this ATP synthase complex does not hydrolyze ATP, but actually the opposite. It produces ATP. Whereas an example of V-type uh, or vacuolar type uh, ATPase is the proton ATPase on the membrane of lysosome, which transports proton or hydrogen ions inside the lumen of ER and is responsible for keeping the lumen of uh, lysosome uh, acidic. And then we've got P-type transporters, and these P-type transporters, 
they do get phosphorylated covalently and a very good example is sodium potassium pump or another example is plasma membrane calcium ATPase. Now here there is a thing that uh, the sodium potassium ATPase is also a non-teport by directionality. What does it mean? We're gonna talk about it when we cover antiport. So now let's talk about the coupled transporters or the secondary type of transporters. Now the secondary type of transporters are divided to symporters and antiporters. But what secondary uh, active transport means by itself is that there is uh, no direct use of ATP. Although even now the ions are uh, transported against their electrochemical gradient potential and the molecules are transported against their concentration uh, uh, gradient potential but they, uh, in contrast with the uh, primary there is no direct ATP hydrolysis what, there, uh, what uh, drives the, the force which drives this kind of transport is the ion flow provided by the electrochemical gradient potential of another ion. Now, if I give you an example, you're going to understand it completely. Let's assume sodium glucose symporter. Now, sodium glucose symporter is expressed on the apical domain of epithelial cells. Uh, of uh, epithelial intestinal cells. If you remember, we said that, gluto, uh, that glucose uniporter is expressed on the basal lateral surface. And now we say that the sodium glucose is uh, expressed on the apical surface. Try to remember these two because uh, they are very connected with each other, their actions. Now, let's assume that this is the membrane of the apical domain of epithelial intestinal cells. And this red uh, square here, this red one, is sodium. And this uh, uh, yellow one is glucose. As you can see, if we want to take up glucose, if this cell wants to take up glucose, it is against its concentration gradient. But on the other hand, taking up uh, sodium is down its electrochemical gradient. So what these type of transporters do is that they transport glucose in expense of taking up two sodium ions. And that is uh, a very interesting and important thing here. The sodium concentration outside the cell. So, as we said, the sodium concentration outside the cell is greater than the sodium concentration inside the cell. But yet, the sodium is always coming in, right? Because it wants to take the glucose in with it. And uh, uh, during a lot of other uh, transport, sodium comes in. So, why the concentration of sodium outside and inside never gets equal? Well, because of sodium-potassium uh, pump sodium potassium pump what it does is that it transports three sodiums outside the cell and two potassiums inside the cell by direct hydrolysis of ATP so that there will always be a greater concentration of sodium outside the cell for uh, reactions like these symporters to occur this concentration is needed so, if they ask you about these symporters or antiporters and you said, well, this happens and the sodium ions help, at the end you have to mention that the concentration gradient of sodium is maintained by the sodium-potassium pump. It's very important. Another example of a symporter is a sodium amino acid symporter. The, the same thing, you just change the glucose with the amino acid. The same thing happens. Now, an example of antiporter. What is an antiporter? An antiporter is exactly like a symporter, 
The only difference is that in this case, our molecule of interest is going in the other direction of the uh, ion, which is providing the energy. So let's assume this time this yellow thing here is not uh, glucose, but it is calcium, and it is in the it's inside the cell. So it wants to go from inside the cell to outside the cell. So the direction of uh, uh, ion flow and the molecule is the opposite. That's what is called antiport. And uh, so the same thing is going to happen. The transport of sodium is going to cover energetically the transport of calcium against its uh, concentration gradient because the calcium... Uh, at the moment that we are talking about, the calcium concentration outside the cell is lower than inside the cell. One thing you need to, uh, it's, that it's important to know in both case of antiporter and symporter is that this transport is simultaneous. That in case of symporter, the transport of glucose and sodium inside the cell is simultaneous and in the same direction. In case of antiporter, the transport of sodium and calcium uh, is simultaneous and in different directions and that is one of the main reasons why sodium potassium pump is not an antiport because the, uh, the the transport of sodium and potassium first of all needs requires the hydrolysis of ATP and second of all is not simultaneous now there's a very good video about this, I'm going to show you, and which shows a sodium potassium pump. You can see here a sodium potassium pump, and after a while, three sodium uh, ions attached to this pump. And then there's an ATP binding site for binding and hydrolysis of ATP. Now, when ATP binds to this site, this whole pump is gonna undergo a conformational change and it's gonna face out uh, to the extracellular portion. And when it faces to extracellular matrix, these sodium ions are gonna leave the pump now. In the other hand, these potassium ions are gonna come and attach to the pump. And then when this phosphate group here, you can see because it is a P-type, as we said, a P-type, uh, primary uh, active transport, it gets covalently phosphorylated. But when this phosphate group leaves, when it gets dephosphorylated, the pump goes back to its main conformation, to the cytosol. It's it's and then it's when the potassiums are gonna also leave to the cytosol. So it's how a, a sodium potassium pump works. So now that we've talked about all types of active and passive transport, mainly, you can very easily understand the glucose uptake by the body. As you can see here, these gray cells are epithelial intestinal cells. And this area is the lumen of intestine and this bluish area is the extracellular fluid. So first of all, uh, we know that the concentration of glucose in the cell, in the epithelial cells, are higher both than the lumen and the extracellular fluid. So when glucose wants to come in the epithelial cells of intestine, we need a type of active transport but not primary active transport we need a secondary type of active transport a glucose sodium symporter and when glucose is in the epithelial cells now the concentration gradient is in favor of the uptake of glucose to the extracellular fluid so we don't need an active transport in case of moving of glucose from the cell to the extracellular fluid what we need is because glucose is so big, it cannot simply diffuse uh, from the, the 
the membrane, we need to facilitate its movement via a special type of transporter, a uniporter. So this depiction is very nice and it's very good to look at it. Now there's a very good question here. What do you expect to occur as a result of inhibition of sodium potassium pump? Now as we said, this sodium concentration outside the cell, this higher sodium concentration outside the cell, which is needed for the action of both symporter in this case and antiporter in case of sodium calcium antiporter we just mentioned. The sodium concentration is maintained by sodium potassium pump. So if sodium potassium pump is uh, inhibited, for example in this case, there will be no glucose uptake, so your body cannot take up glucose, which is the primary source of energy for the body, and that would be disastrous. Now let's talk about something else. Now, as you probably know, in order for the muscle cells to contract, a high concentration of calcium is needed. So, this high concentration of calcium will be provided via calcium channels. When there's calcium channels open, a lot of calcium is going to rush in the cell and is going gonna, is gonna to promote the contraction of the muscle cells. But after the contraction is done, the cells, the muscle cells, need to get rid of the excess of calcium inside the cell. Now, the way they're going to do it is that they have some calcium, some plasma membrane calcium ATPase on their membrane, as, which as we said is an example of P-type uh, active transporter. But in some specific muscle cells, like heart muscle cells, which need uh, some more intense, more regulated uh, kind of contraction, there is an additional type of transporter, a sodium-calcium antiporter, which we talked about. Now, what sodium-calcium antiporter does, as we said, is that it imports sodium and exports calcium. And each calcium it exports, it needs to import three sodiums in expense. Now, here, uh, the, the text says that uabin and digitalis are used for treating patients with heart diseases because they make heart muscle cells contract more strongly. And how do they do it? They inhibit sodium potassium. It was a potassium here. Sodium potassium pump in the plasma membrane of these cells. How, uh, why do you think is that? Because, again, when sodium potassium pump is inhibited, that sodium concentration which we just talked about is not going to be maintained. So the sodium uh, calcium antiporter cannot work. And if the sodium calcium antiporter cannot work, calcium cannot be exported out the cell. So calcium will remain in the cells, in this case heart muscle cells, more. It will stay there longer. And so the contraction of heart muscle cells will be prolonged. And now that we've covered approximately everything about uh, the transport, there's only one more thing to talk about. And that's the concept of lipid water partitioning coefficient. Now, in this case, minimals really help. Minimals always help. Now, what is lipid water partitioning coefficient? Lipid water partitioning coefficient is a quotient used for characterization of hydrophobic character. Its ratio, it's the ratio of equilibrium concentrations of molecules measured in continuous lipid and water phases. And its formula is R equals the concentration of lipid, lipidophilic over the concentration of the hydrophilic. Now, let's break it down because it, it seems that this, uh, this uh, explanation is not really... Uh, helping but in reality it's very easy now we said 
that some molecules are hydrophilic, some molecules are hydrophobic. But it's not always black and white. Most molecules have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, uh, characters at the same time. It's just that the ratio differs, that some molecules are more hydrophobic. It doesn't mean that they are not hydrophilic at all. It means that they're like 60% hydrophobic and they're like 40% hydrophilic. So what this uh, lipid water uh, partitioning coefficient gives us is that how much a hydrophobic material something is. And that is basically the quotient here, that the concentration of the lipidophilic part of the material to the concentration of the hydrophilic part of the material. So this, this first uh, sentence, it's a quotient, used for characterization of the hydrophobic character means it's used to see how much a hydrophobic is a molecule. And this ratio is the equilibrium concentrations of a molecule measured in lipid and water phases. So if a molecule is uh, measured in both lipid and water phases, we can see how much of it is dissolved uh, in a water uh, phase and how much of it is dissolved in lipid phase. But at the end, what it gives us, the more, actually the more R is, the more lipid water partitioning coefficient is, so the more hydrophobic something will be. So the more hydrophobic something is, the more hydrophobic a molecule is, the faster it will pass through the cell membrane. Why? Because if you remember, cell membrane is more hydrophobic. And the hydrophobic material, the nonpolar material, can pass through the cell membrane better. So the more R is, the better, the faster the, the molecule will pass through the cell membrane and the greater intracellular concentration that molecule reaches. Now, what is the medical significance of uh, uh, such a phenomenon? What's the medical significance of knowing the lipid water partitioning coefficient? Well, in case of anesthetics, because as you can see, the more hydrophobic an anesthetic is, the, you can see here, uh, the more the lipid uh, water partitioning coefficient is, the less effective it will be. It's the minimal effectiveness. The minimal effectiveness. So uh, when we have the uh, the, the greatest uh, uh, lipid water coefi uh, partitioning coefficient in case of an anesthetics, the minimal the minimal amount of that anesthetic required to actually knock you down is lower. Why? Because that anesthetic is uh, got an uh, higher lipid water partitioning coefficient because it is more hydrophobic because it can pass through your cell membranes faster and it can reaches uh, it can reach higher concentrations in your cell so it will be more effective in your cells whereas you can see the anesthetics with very uh, very low lipid water partitioning coefficient the minimal effectiveness of them is so high we, we need to apply a lot of those anesthetics in order to have effectiveness now i've never seen them giving direct questions from the lipid water partitioning coefficient uh, for example from these graphs and how to you know uh, interpret the lipid water partitioning coefficient or to calculate the ratio i've never seen that if you know the concept, I think you're good for this. And that is almost it for this uh, lecture. And cell membrane and transport is over. See you in another lecture.